Um, no one 12 months ago was talking about a global financial crisis. Now everybody is talking about a global financial crisis. How do you cover an economic crisis as deep and confusing as... Nobody seems to know what's going on in the world. Nobody seems to know. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball. And if there have been any lessons learned, Mr Speaker, over the last 30 years in Australia, it is the government should not be involved in banking. Australia is currently enjoying the strongest global economy in over 30 years and a massive mining boom which is filling the government's coffers. An unprecedented $42 billion nation building and jobs plan to support jobs and to invest in Australia's long term economic future. No one 12 months ago was talking about a global financial crisis. On the 25th of July, 2007, I warned that we were at the beginning of a countdown for a collapse of the world monetary financial system. This occurs at a time where the world monetary financial system is actually now currently in the process of disintegrating. Nothing mysterious about this. I've talked about it for some time. It's been in progress. It's not abating. What's listed as stock values and market values in the financial markets internationally is bunk. These are purely fictitious beliefs. There's no truth to it. The fakery is enormous. There is no possibility of a non-collapse of the present financial system. None. It's finished now. The present financial system cannot continue to exist under any circumstances, under any presidency, under any leadership, or any leadership of nations. Only a fundamental and sudden change in the world monetary financial system will prevent a general, immediate, chain reaction type of collapse. At what speed, we don't know, but it will go on and it will be unstoppable. And the longer it goes on, before being coming to an end, the worst things will get. July 25, 2007 was certainly not the first time American economist Lyndon LaRouche had warned of the collapse of the world economy. Yet today's politicians, economists, bankers, media pundits and similar illiterates are lying their heads off telling us that no one could have foreseen this crisis. The current economic crisis is the worst collapse in all human history which if continued will be far worse than even the 14th century Dark Age, which killed one-third of Europe's population through starvation and disease. Today's economic collapse is not a mere monetary problem, but a breakdown of the world's real physical economy. The world's population of 6.7 billion people is right now under threat and could plunge to less than 2 billion people in very short order. Nations as we know them today under these failing economic and social conditions will cease to exist as entire regions of the world descend into conflict and chaos. In the 14th century, under feudalism, there were no such things as nation-states. Society was controlled by a private group of international bankers based in Venice who ran a privately controlled international monetary system. The Venetian system was based, like that of today, upon usury and speculation, and like today, it was a system that attacked human civilization and human populations. In modern times, the British Empire, an identical and direct descendant of that Venetian system, has continued to control the international monetary system since its establishment following the worldwide Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763. This empire, an international empire of finance, evolved from the 18th century British empire of armies and gunboats. The failure to eliminate the British empire following World War II has brought us to this crisis today. Around the world, American economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche 
together with the Citizens Electoral Council and LaRouche Youth Movement in Australia, have been leading the fight to protect the population from this financial collapse through reorganisation in bankruptcy. On the other hand, the world's financial oligarchy based in the City of London insists that we just bail out the current system and shut up about the causes of the crisis. LaRouche has already drafted legislation which will provide a solution, which will halt the collapse of the real economy and kickstart the recovery. That policy is his Homeowners and Bank Protection Act, in Australia known as his Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill. This presentation will elaborate on the method behind this urgent policy and explain why it is that all other so-called solutions by economists, politicians and the like today are doomed to fail. The failure to halt the economic collapse with bailouts and stimulus packages put forward by the multitude of economic illiterates gives us good reason to ask ourselves the important question. Can we really trust those who gave us the economic disease to now provide us with the cure? LaRouche's unmatched accuracy in all of his economic forecasts over the last 50 years has been a result of the unique scientific method he used to make those forecasts. It is a method rooted in the science of physical economy. LaRouche's physical economy has to do with physical values, which these days is quite unusual because everyone who so-called economists talk about monetary and financial values but LaRouche's physical economy is concerned about things like real physical production, manufacturing, farming, what's the state of our infrastructure, what's the state of our healthcare system, what, uh, you know, how are we educating our kids, how, many, how much money are we putting into educating our population in general. LaRouche discovered, through his early scientific work studying the 17th and 19th century physicists Gottfried Leibniz and Bernhard Riemann, that what lay at the heart of economy was the ability for human beings to transform their potential in the universe without limits. At the core of LaRouche's economic method lay the science of human creativity and its power to change the physical world. Because we have creative reason, we can make discoveries of how the universe works. For example, there are physical principles in the universe which are unseen by the senses, but because we are endowed with this creativity, we can make discoveries of these physical principles, take those discoveries, and through science and technology, then apply them to the productive processes involved in manufacturing and other forms of production. This then has the ability of increasing the productive output of mankind and LaRouche refers to that as the productive powers of labour. LaRouche understood that if the physical process of human beings changing their relationship to nature and to the universe through creative discoveries were disregarded and suppressed in an economic system, then that system would certainly degenerate and collapse with that civilization along with it. This crucial difference between LaRouche's method and that of all other economists can be seen in a simple pedagogy known as his triple curve function. The triple curve function was developed by LaRouche in 1995 as a visual model to describe the behavior of any typical economic collapse process. During the economic collapse of 1987, LaRouche was the only figure publicly calling for putting the world financial system through bankruptcy reorganization measures to rebuild the world's physical economy. 
The triple curve illustrates the collapse of an economy that's operating under a monetary system instead of a credit system. And it was a device designed by LaRouche to show how the economy operates under physical constraints, which when operated as a monetary system will lead to an inevitable collapse. A monetary system is a parasitical economic system run by private central bankers. And this system feeds off the physical economy, the important part of the economy that sustains us. What the bankers do is they direct the credit and resources of an economy into financial paper trading at the expense of the real economy. So what you see is a boom in trading shares and bonds and derivatives like mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations. And this uh, boom in this type of trading you know, increases exponentially. And that's the financial aggregates curve of the triple curve. Now, while it's growing, the physical economy is being looted because it's being starved of credit that's being drawn out of the physical economy and shoveled into financial paper speculation. And consequently, you have a collapse in the physical economy. And this is represented by the bottom curve of the triple curve, uh, sharply turning downwards in the opposite direction of the growth of the financial aggregates. And you see it happening all around us, right? Because the important parts of the economy there's, don't get invested in. Infrastructure does not get invested in at the rate it should be. Manufacturing does not get invested in the rate it should be. Agriculture gets starved of credit. And you see a collapse in those areas. In a country like Australia, we see collapsing infrastructure all around us. Our major cities do not have reliable water supplies. They're, they're running short. Um, they do not have reliable power systems. The great city of Sydney has just suffered two power blackouts in a row that no one can fully explain. Right? These, this is uh, a, a supposedly advanced industrial country. Um, our rural areas are being depopulated. Our country towns are being turned into ghost towns because agriculture is collapsing because it's not being invested in at the, way, the rate it should be. And so when the curves of the triple curve become completely disconnected from each other, right? when the physical economy can no longer sustain uh, and, be, and feed the financial aggregates curve on the triple curve, you have a total breakdown. And at that point, the system has to be put through bankruptcy reorganisation or no one will survive. In the year 2000, LaRouche updated the triple curve as the global financial system hit a critical breakdown point. The financial system had entered its final phase of disintegration. He revised the triple curve to show a process whereby monetary aggregates overtook financial aggregates, the growth, the rate of growth in monetary aggregates overtook financial aggregates. Because what was clear is the economy was at a point where um, governments were just effectively printing money. And what Lynn showed is that when this growth in monetary aggregates overstripped financial aggregates, you, you reached a point which was the beginning of financial hyperinflation. He began warning that the world was heading towards a repeat of Weimar Germany in 1923, you know, where it took a wheelbarrow of money to buy a loaf of bread, except on a global scale. Monetary systems under the control of private financial interests have always been devoted to the usury and subjugation of human populations, reflected in the way that the physical economy is looted to increase financial wealth in the hands of a tiny financial oligarchy. In this way, ever since the British Empire was formed following the Treaty of Paris in 1763, its existence has relied on the manipulation of peoples, and more importantly, on the control of a global monetary system through free trade, which maintains control over populations. We say, what is the body of the British Empire? Well, let's talk about a slime mold. Um, what you have is you have a mass, the core thing is a mass of people called bankers, speculators and similar types, Venetian type, users. Hmm? The users are engaged in trying to control the world as a whole, exploit the world as a whole. 
and they are killing each other in competition at the same time. So now you have a club like organized crime, and organized crime is based on this model. Well, it's a Venetian model. You have a bunch of predators, usurers. They kill each other by night. They rob each other. They wipe out whole parts of their tribe and create new parts of the tribe. So now you have a slime mold. There's people who represent this who are engaged in a game, like a, like a gladiatorial game. And they're determined that they're going to control the world. That is the empire. It's a sociological process, a dynamic sociological process of that type. And this process says it's going to rule the world. And whenever somebody from the outside moves in, they kill each other. They're like that. They're cannibals. But if you start from the outside to change, to eliminate their system, they will kill. They will kill en masse. Or if they think you're even thinking about it, they may decide to kill en masse. And what they've done often is they've started wars. The British method is not, in particular, is not to uh, go out and fight to win a war. The British method is to get other people to go out and fight a war and kill each other. And they then come in and pick up the pieces after the people have exhausted themselves in, in killing each other. In order to rid the world of the degrading impact of the British Empire, United States President Franklin Roosevelt organized the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. Roosevelt intended to use the occasion to establish a new economic system, a global credit system, which would free the world from the grip of the British Empire and replace it with absolutely sovereign nations. Even before Roosevelt was elected US President in 1932, he was targeted for assassination by the financial powers in both London and Wall Street who hated him. The same financial circles who supported and financed the rise to power of Mussolini and Hitler. During the 1940s wartime alliance between the US and Britain, these fascist financial circles were still determined to destroy all the policies Roosevelt represented. Under the direction of John Maynard Keynes, the leader of the British delegation to the Bretton Woods Conference, the British worked to sabotage the policies Roosevelt and the Americans set out to achieve, fighting against the implementation of an international credit system, and instead defending an international monetary system which would maintain the power of the private financial interests that had supported Mussolini and Hitler. The British wanted a continuation of what their imperial power had been based on for 200 years, unfettered free trade and a monetary system where the power of finance could dictate to nations. Roosevelt wanted what was known as the American system, right? a national credit system where governments had the ultimate control of their nation's credit and could direct that credit to their own national economic development, building their own infrastructure, fostering agricultural industries, fostering manufacturing industries, and harnessing credit for that purpose. That's what Roosevelt wanted. And so the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 was going to hash that out. And ultimately, at the Bretton Woods Conference, Roosevelt's faction prevailed. Right? And they devised the, the, po the post-war Bretton Woods system. And it was a system with heavy regulation for uh, finance. You know, governments were empowered to use uh, capital controls to control the flow of finance in and out of their countries. The uh, currencies of the world would, would be uh, set to the US dollar, right? They'd all be fixed. And this was a, you know, essential regulation to provide stability in the system. Following Roosevelt's untimely death in 1945, London used their manipulated tool, the close friend of Winston Churchill, President Harry Truman, to replace Roosevelt's Bretton Woods system with a British monetary system. 
One exception to this immediate change in policy was the agreement of fixed exchange rates amongst currencies, which would last until 1971. However, under British direction, Truman and the Wall Street fascists began to take down the national credit policies Roosevelt had implemented since 1933. The United States' commitment to achieving a world of absolutely sovereign nation-states under a stable international credit system was scrapped, replaced with a commitment to keep the policies of an Anglo-Dutch empire under the new name of globalization. When Roosevelt died in April 1945, a lot of his plans were shelved. The essential idea of the world economy being a credit system and not a monetary system was also turned around. Right, and you saw, and, and the way the world's seen this is in the way institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have, have become dictators to countries. Lyndon LaRouche understood the principled fight between what Roosevelt represented on the one side and the British Empire, typified by Winston Churchill, on the other. With this understanding, together with his knowledge of the physical principles underlying economics, he recognised the direction the economy was then being steered as a consequence of Roosevelt's death. Rather than converting the productive war machine of the United States following the end of World War II for the purpose of assisting the development of newly freed nations from colonialism, President Truman went in the opposite direction. Under Truman, and then later under the direction of economic advisers such as Arthur Burns, the United States relaxed control of its monetary lending practices, making possible the build-up of a consumer debt bubble with the intention to trap American consumers into debt for the purchase of increasingly poor quality manufactured products. This change in direction within the United States coincided with a growth in speculation of currencies and gold in Europe by leading banks which threatened to collapse the value of the US dollar and unhinge the policy of fixed exchange rates, the last vestige of Roosevelt's original Bretton Woods system. These changes in policies and practice provoked Lyndon LaRouche to issue his first economic forecast in 1956. LaRouche warned that a sharp recession would begin in early 1957. By February of that year, the historic recession of 1957 had begun. Lyndon LaRouche saw where this was going. Right? He saw that the essential strength of the American economy in physical productive terms was being undermined. And he saw that because of that, this would have consequences for the whole world economy. Because the American economy uh, was the biggest economy in the world and the American dollar was the reserve currency for the Bretton Woods system. LaRouche made his first forecast in the late 1950s, which predicted the late 50s, early 60s recession. And then from the 60, early 60s onwards, he began warning about the consequences to the world and the Bretton Woods system from these, this folly of monetarism that America had embarked on, with one or two exceptions. One exception was the space program, initiated by John F. Kennedy where a lot of investment went into high technology areas that saw that real benefits for the American economy. But uh, while that was going on, the economy otherwise was allowed to deteriorate. And by 1968, for example, in infrastructure terms, American infrastructure investment went negative. By August 1971, US President Richard Nixon under the direction of the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, George Shultz, a key British asset in the United States. Nixon was prevailed upon to end the Bretton Woods system, which proved LaRouche's forecast to be absolutely right. And this ending the Bretton Woods system decoupled the, the world financial system from any vestige of you know, the physical economy from that point. With the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system by actually George Shultz, as for the, uh, we went into a complete 
inflationary system. At that time, that's when I said, this is, we either go to a, this reform or we go to fascism in that direction. And we have been drifting toward a fascist movement toward in policy, which was implicitly going toward hyperinflation. So at that point in the early 1970s, I, the policy of my association was always based on this perspective. Either we went back to the kind of policies that Franklin Roosevelt had represented, or we would go into a pro-fascist trend, which would also be inflationary and would become hyperinflationary, which would meant the system would break down if this process was continued. In the 1970s, a series of economic shocks were orchestrated to intensify the shift away from the stability of Bretton Woods. Beginning 1973, the British and Saudi financial establishments launched operations to create an artificial oil shortage, an oil price hoax, to place the world financial system in the hands of the City of London and Wall Street. Under the terms of the Saudis, oil would only be sold in US dollars, at the same time the price of oil had been artificially inflated by 400%. As a consequence, developing nations around the world were economically gutted, having their national currencies devalued while their foreign debt levels exploded in an attempt to survive. The US dollar, now effectively pegged to oil, was placed under the control of a joint British-Saudi conspiracy. Simultaneous to these conditions, sovereign governments around the world were under attack by the forces of London. In Chile, the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende was toppled, overthrown by the commander of Chile's army, Augusto Pinochet, who ran a political assassination operation which involved the use of ex-members of the Nazi regime of Germany. It was backed by the leading financial powers in the world. It was, it was, a, it was a coup run by Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, Milton Friedman, the Chicago University gang that were all part of the British Crown's Economic Warfare Unit, the Mont Paladin Society. And under Pinochet, he had a Nazi totalitarian regime and a free market economy. And this in turn became the model for what they expected other countries to follow. Now in Australia, you had an assault on our government. The Whitlam government of that era, 1972 to 1975, wasn't perfect. But it was the first Labor government for 23 years. It had in that government key people that still clung to the Labor vision of true economic sovereignty for Australia, still knew their enemy was the money power, and their main campaign in those years was to buy back the farm. They wanted to rid Australia of the foreign control of our economic resources, you know, which Australia's economy is famous for, all these you know, bountiful mineral supplies, etc. Rid us of that economic control, get rid of it, so that we can develop those resources for the common good of Australia. That was what they wanted to do. And Rex Connor, Whitlands Minerals and Energies Minister, called it, buy back the farm. We're going to buy back the farm. However, under this new world, of globalization that was not acceptable and the uh, in particular Rio Tinto or CRA it was called then owned by the Queen of England would have been the biggest loser the whole British Crown City of London raw materials cartel would have been kicked out of Australia and they weren't gonna let that happen and so we had the Australian equivalent of a coup which had not which wasn't the first time it had ever been done in Australia the Crown in the form of the Viceroy, the Governor-General, stepped in and sacked our democratically elected government. And that was the issue. Them asserting they were not going to let our government assert Australia's economic sovereignty against their wishes. Whitlam's sacking in 1975 marked the beginning of the end for Australia's economic sovereignty. In the years to follow, under both successive Liberal and Labor governments, the economic policies would serve to force open Australia as the London and Wall Street financial establishment intended. The commitment to the old Labour tradition of fighting for a sovereign Australia, with control of its own financial system, 
was replaced with the reheated leftovers of 18th century free trade. In 1979, a report had been commissioned which became known as the Campbell Report and it was headed up by Sir Keith Campbell, a top Australian financier who was an Australian associate of one of the very top American financiers, very close to the British Crown, Sir Paul Mallon. Uh, Keith Campbell's report into financial deregulation recommended that Australia's banking system be deregulated, foreign banks be let into the country, the dollar be floated, those types of measures which ended up happening. But when they came, uh, these, these recommendations were seen as so radical under the Malcolm Fraser, John Howard government, that John Howard couldn't get any support for them, even though that was a liberal government, right? The the party of big business, etc. That was radical to them. So when Hawke and Keating came to power in '83, Bob Hawke bragged that they came to power fully intending to implement the Campbell Report, except they knew that if they just adopted a, the Conservative government's report, that that would have been regarded as very weird by their traditional Labor supporters. So they put up a dummy commission known as the Martin Inquiry to look into the financial system and make exactly the same recommendations that the Campbell report had and voila, it was their own Labor Party report. This report completely deregulated the Australian economy and Paul Keating implemented it with gusto. He deregulated the banks. He floated the Australian dollar in 1983, and the dollar collapsed. He opened Australia up to foreign banks for the first time. And as a curiosity, the second foreign bank to be given a bank trading license in Australia was Hill Samuel, which now today is known as Macquarie Bank. And these reforms by Keating removed all the uh, regulations that had protected the Australian financial system from the worst excesses of globalisation and had ensured the Australian financial system to a point at least functioned to facilitate the physical economy. And that was all torn up. And what it, what it did was allow the kind of looting of the physical economy that characterises monetary systems in general. Removing the long-term stability of the Bretton Woods system and opening up currencies and financial markets to speculators had one major physical effect. A global collapse of real economic productivity. To make money, new forms of immoral and destructive practices in financial speculation were legalised. The system was once again operating firmly under the control of private central banks which pumped money into the stock market and into financial paper, while more and more productive industries were being sold off and carved into pieces for financial vultures. By early 1987, the physical economy had already collapsed, and the 1980s speculative stock market and related bubbles were set to pop. Early that year, LaRouche forecast the coming October 1987 crash, issuing a call to urgently shift the policy of the United States to avoid the oncoming economic depression. The crash occurred as he warned, and in the early months of 1988, LaRouche addressed an audience on US national television as part of his presidential campaign, explaining the nature of the 1987 collapse and the economic situation while providing an insight into his method of physical economy. Now, imagine we're back in October 1929. I drop this ball. Let's see how that looks on the Wall Street Journal's chart. The picture isn't exactly the same, but the general idea is about the same. Now, come back to the middle of October 1987. The ball I'm holding is not the same ball I dropped back in 1929, but it is a similar ball. The same thing happens with this ball in 1987 and 1988 that happened in 1929 and 1930. 
Why should an economy act like a bouncing ball? Back in Hoover's time and again today. There are physical laws which cause a financial collapse to resemble a bouncing ball whenever a financial collapse is caused by a prolonged contraction of industrial and agricultural production. All of the ordinary rules of market behavior go out the window. Once the crisis begins, the financial markets do not go all the way to the bottom in the first panic. After the first drop, the markets tend to stabilize so that foolish people may believe that a recovery has begun. A few months later, the next drop comes, and then a temporary stabilization at a lower level before the next drop. Now, this is not the place to explain the physical principles involved, but you see the general idea. The bouncing ball is an illustration of how the economy is constrained by physical processes. There's no, what drives the economy is not the financial system that can just be inflated with more money. It's ultimately physical, and the bouncing ball shows as each as uh, with each successive bounce it shows the energy leaving the system and at a certain point the energy will entirely leave the system and you've got a dead flat economy with the banks of australia and the world bankrupt in 1987 having accumulated huge unpayable debts as a consequence of their speculation larouche continued to outline the steps for a return to real economic development Forecasting a collapse of the Soviet Union in the coming months and a slide into the worst depression of the century, LaRouche called for nations around the world to use the historic moment to rebuild, returning to the tradition of scientific and technological progress. Meanwhile, the incoming U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan, had other plans. Alan Greenspan became Chairman of the Federal Reserve and he began deploying a, an economic policy which he'd call bubbles. He, cre he deliberately inflated credit bubbles, speculative bubbles in the economy, as a way of propping up the economy. He used government agencies in America, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to buy the bad debts off the American banks and take them onto these government agencies. And then in order to handle those, they securitized them like mortgage-backed securities today, bundled up these bad mortgage, bad debts and sold them on to investors. And this began the, what we call the mother of all bubbles, the derivatives bubble, which at that time measured about a trillion dollars. From 1993, Lyndon LaRouche was warning about how insane derivatives were, because in a sense, derivatives represented the, the uh, how far world economic policy had gone from what he'd called for back in 1987, right? A total bankruptcy reorganization so everything would be put back on a sound physical economic footing. The legalization and massive spread of securities and derivatives during the early 1990s confirmed LaRouche's 1970s warnings once again. The world financial system had now arrived at the era of hyperinflation. The CEC produced our own warnings about derivatives from 1994 and we printed uh, graphs showing the holdings of derivatives by our own banks and they were already massively exposed to derivatives back then right and so we could see where this was going because it, 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 the world had veered sharply towards a wasn't even just a, a system based on debt and monetarism per se but the most crazy speculative instruments which can only be likened to gambler side bets. In 1994, LaRouche issued his ninth long-range forecast that the financial markets would enter a disintegration process in the near term where the only means of delaying an inevitable death of the post-1971 system would be hyperinflation. However, the United States didn't walk down the pathway of folly alone. The Labor and Liberal parties in Australia, acting under the direction of first Keating and then Howard, were in lockstep with Greenspan all the way to the cliff edge of July 2007 and even beyond. By the time he took power in 1983, Paul Keating's idea for Australia was a total Adam Smith model economy in a globalised world 
where every country has its own specialization. And Keating's stated idea for the Australian economy is that our specialization was raw materials, and that's what we should concentrate on. To have a raw materials economy, we needed total free trade, just a, total, a complete throwback to the, to the days and the arguments of the East India Company. Any other economy, any other industry in our economy that survived under these circumstances, well and good, but they were not to be the priority. The priority was just Australia being a quarry for a globalised world economy, which is what we have become. In 1987, Keating went on to his next area of reform, which was tariffs. This gutted Australian manufacturing, like our traditional textile, clothing and footwear industry. It gutted agriculture, traditional agricultural areas like you know, citrus and pork and all these, all these areas of domestic production, which were then forced to compete with cheap imports from overseas and just gutted whole industries in Australia. In, as of 1989, Keating embarked on the next phase of his reform program, which was privatisation. Major public assets in Australia began being sold off. The Commonwealth Bank was the leading one. Qantas uh, was another major one that was sold off by the federal government and a whole host of smaller ones. In order to maintain the appearance of wealth, money was fed into successive bubbles while the last vestiges of Roosevelt's bank regulations were being torn down. In 1999, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, today the Director of President Obama's National Economic Council, acted on behalf of the Wall Street forces he represented under the Bill Clinton administration to push through the repeal of Glass-Steagall. These were the banking regulations established by Roosevelt, used to safeguard the savings and pensions of the people from investment bankers who used money to gamble in derivatives and other Ponzi schemes. After a little while, they ran out of legitimate ways to fuel it. Right? The, the market for mortgages was saturated. So in, the, in America, you saw the rise in illegitimate avenues to feed the property bubble, namely subprime loans. It was all securitization, mortgage-backed securities. They were feeding a bubble. It didn't, to them, it didn't matter. And they thought, they were really clever, they thought they'd derivatized the risk component out of it. They'd sold that off sideways as a credit default swap. AIG held all these credit default swaps in London, right? And that, that took care of the risk component. And they thought they were on a winner. This would fuel the bubble forever. And it didn't. Recognize, as I said before, the problem here is, is that we have been not, it's not because of this financial investment or that financial investment or this monetary thing. It's because we have adopted policies of practice in succession, especially over the post-war period, since the time that Roosevelt died. We have adopted policies which, in each case, as my own experience proves, have led predictably to a collapse of the system as it was operating then. And that we have reacted again, predictably, to policies which led predictably to another collapse of the U.S. economy. It's not a monetary statistical thing. If you are, if you are, not, if you are not increasing your productivity, then attrition is taking over. If you're est overestimating your income and drawing, down, drawing it down, you are going to have a collapse. And I can say, uh, my authority is I have predicted these things a number of times, forecast them, and they've always happened exactly as I've said, where everybody who uses different methods has been wrong. No one, has, no one matched me on, on 57. It was precise. No one matched me on these other crises. They were all predictable. They were all foreseeable. Not by statistics, but by understanding the physical principles of economy.
Between July and September of 2007, Lyndon LaRouche announced a three-step policy measure, in principle, which would provide a pathway out of financial disintegration. That policy, still today, is his homeowners and bank protection bill. The policy spread like wildfire across America as the housing bubble blew out, throwing communities into financial and social crisis, while states and local governments were facing severe budget deficits. Beginning in August of 2007, the LaRouche movement began gathering thousands of endorsements supporting the policy from individual political and union representatives, local councils and several state legislatures. In Australia, the policy proposal gathered similar support from local councils, with several passing resolutions supporting the policy and hundreds of individual councillors and citizens signing in support, calling for the Australian government to discuss the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill. In January 2008, the Citizens Electoral Council began campaigning for LaRouche's Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill for here in Australia. And there's two crucial elements of that bill. The first is the Australian banking system has to be put through effectively bankruptcy reorganisation, like a Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganisation, as they say, in the United States. The second part is that we have to put an urgent freeze on all homeowner mortgage foreclosures and family farm foreclosures to keep people in their homes. Now, these two elements of the policy of the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill won't function by themselves. So this happens in conjunction with LaRouche's international proposal for a new Bretton Woods financial and monetary system. Now, Mr LaRouche is calling upon the leadership of the nations of Russia, China, India and the United States to, put to, get, to come together and make a political decision to say that this global financial and monetary system is utterly bankrupt and we need a new system. Therefore, we have to put the existing system through bankruptcy reorganisation, but we need a new system which is based upon not this crazy Keynesian monetarist garbage we've had for the last 60 years, but upon the principles of national banking and credit creation, as Franklin Roosevelt initially uh, prescribed back in uh, 1944, before it was derailed by the Keynesians. Now, under this New Bretton Woods proposal is centred around national banking and credit creation. You have sovereign, perfectly sovereign nation states that then can create the credit they need for their own internal development. And because you have currencies that are then sovereign and nations that are sovereign, you can establish treaty arrangements between current countries to determine exchange rate values of various currencies. And then you can have real economic development over the long term because countries aren't being looted like they were in the 80s, in particular 80s and 90s, through massive currency devaluations from the floating exchange rate system. What's required in Australia is for the government to create a federal agency to place our Australian banks under protection, whilst at the same time freezing all mortgages for homeowners and family farmers. This is to adjust the value of those mortgages back to something that is reasonable given that we've been in a, in, a, in a real estate bubble for many years and also to adjust interest rates back to something that's actually reasonable. We also have to look at the huge amount of speculative debt in the banking system. Now this $14.2 trillion of derivatives, over-the-counter derivatives and other toxic debt in our banking system has to be written off. So that has to be done as well. Whilst this is going on, we have to stop foreclosures on our own occupied homes, family homes and family farms. Currently, JP Morgan Fujitsu is forecasting 7.5% unemployment. Now, we know that it's going to go much, much higher than this, but under their figures, they are saying that 1.2 million householders will be in mortgage stress by December this year and also 30,000 homeowners will be foreclosed upon. Now we have to keep people in their homes, encourage these mortgage holders to pay monthly repayments to recapitalise the banking system whilst we sort out the entire system. 
What we also need is a national bank, like we've had in our country in the past in the form of the Commonwealth Bank, to create enormous amounts of cheap credit for large-scale projects to re-energise our physical economy. If we do that, then we can transform this crisis uh, that we have now. Throughout the Great Depression of the 1930s, the United States and Australia were at war with the private financial interests centred in London. As the Great Depression deepened, nations faced a choice between paying off the interest on unpayable debts or protecting their population from the effects of the physical economic collapse. In Australia, London was locked in a battle with the Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang. Lang, as the New South Wales Treasurer from 1920 to 1922, had become acutely aware of the methods of finance used by the Bank of England to maintain its control over colonial subjects. With this understanding, he fought to defend Australia from the attacks then being carried out by London on its sovereignty. As the British demanded payment from Australia for the debts of World War I, a war Britain itself had orchestrated, Jack Lang, seeing that this would destroy the nation and the welfare of the people, fought back. Jack Lang, as the uh, Premier of New South Wales, was faced with the consequences of the, great, of the Great Depression. So consequently, he had a choice. He could look after the bondholders of England and starve his population, literally, or he could say, go to hell, Bank of England, go to hell, English bondholders, I am elected to look after the general welfare of my population, and he did. Consequently, this caused a great degree of consternation by the private banks and by the City of London, to the point that they even established fascist armies down here, like the old and the new guard, specifically designed to uh, take, take out Jack Lang, to, to get rid of the guy through military force, if necessary. Franklin Roosevelt did the same thing. He said, through his forgotten man uh, speeches and the forgotten man idea, he decided to put the private banking system into bankruptcy reorganisation. And through the Home, Loans, uh, bank, the Home Loans Corporation that he established, he was able to save over 50% of the homeowners that were in foreclosure at that particular point from going, uh, going to the wall. But Jack Lang created a lot of enemies by taking on the English bondholders because this principle of the general welfare was something that really hadn't been tested uh, in, in Australian history before. I mean, there was within the Labor Party, the principle of uh, having a national bank was well and truly established by the likes of King O'Malley in, in 1911. But the idea of actually fighting for the general welfare and putting your name on the line and calling for debt moratoriums as he did uh, you know, on, the, on the debts and actually providing for the people first, well that was a first in Australia and that's why Jack Lang in the end got sacked because it was either the interests of the empire aka the international financiers at that point through the English bondholders and the Bank of England or it was the general welfare and he got sacked because he supported the general welfare. Lang's dismissal by the New South Wales Governor Sir Philip Game threw the Federal and State Labor Party into deep internal division. On the one side, the British Loyalist faction insisted that the demands of Britain's oligarchs be met, even if the people starved, while the Lang faction, devoted passionately to maintaining the general welfare during the Depression years, insisted that the oligarchs should get nothing at all. Now, the actions of the private banks really enraged the population to the point that even a conservative government had to hold a royal commission into the role of the private banks. Now, it sort of avoided the, the, the issue like most royal commissions do. But coming out of that royal commission, the, 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 the principal issue was, in fact, clarified, and that is that governments have the role and responsibility to control credit and control banking practices in the country. That's a very important principle. That was princip the, the, the main uh, thrust of what came out of the Royal Commission. Now, the Conservative government at that point didn't do anything about it because they were, in the, they were beholden to the private banks. But what was interesting was that when John Curtin and Ben Chifley 
the Labor government came to power in 1941, John Curtin adopted the Royal Commission's findings as Labor Party policy because what the Labor Party saw was the need for the government to control the private banking system through you know, controlling interest rates, through controlling the amount of credit that is issued and those sorts of issues with inside the economy. Now, that's effectively what they, uh, John Curtin and Chifley did under wartime regulations right up until 1945. But as you can imagine, the private banks were not happy. For the sake of the population in, from, from, uh, during the war years, they had to wear the regulations, but they were not happy. I mean, the regulations require that they even put money as statutory reserve deposit uh, into the Commonwealth Bank. So the Commonwealth Bank had, you know, in a sense, fingertip control of the private banking system as a policy of government. In 1945, Chifley moved to codify the wartime regulations and make them into law because, of course, the war had finished. And the private banks hated him for that because it meant that their, their powers were going to be restricted. The power of the City of London, the private banks, was, was being massively constricted. Uh, he had a massive fight through 45, 46 to the point that he moved to nationalise the banking system for, along the same principles that the role of government, the role of the Commonwealth Bank is to control the economy, control the interest rates, control the credit and, uh, and, and, and control the private banking system as a whole. Now that was defeated because through the Privy Council, through the City of London, via the Privy Council to the High Court here, that legislation to nationalise the banks was overturned. And then you have a history from there forth in this country, right up until 1959 to 1960, where effectively the Commonwealth Bank was stripped of its powers to control interest rates. That was handed to a private reserve bank. And from there on, the, the Commonwealth Bank was destroyed and eventually sold off. In recent years, it has been a younger generation of the same old fascist circles that Roosevelt, Lang and Chifley fought that have been demanding all of the so-called stimulus packages and bailouts today, whereby national governments are being induced or panicked into printing tens of trillions of dollars to hand over to the private banks. These same circles have acted with their political stooges since 2007 to prevent LaRouche's essential solution from even being discussed in the seats of the US Federal Congress or in Australia's Parliament. Instead, the economic illiterates have been working hard through the night to stimulate the economy with their packages. They make lying claims that a monetary solution, using taxpayer money, will get a rise out of the economy. However, the only thing that fondling money can do in this time of economic disintegration is lead to hyperinflation in the curve of financial and monetary aggregates. The G20 is an orgy of insanity because all it is looking at is how do we throw more gasoline on the fire. The problem has been caused by globalisation, deregulation, privatisation and policies that intrinsically treat money as something valuable. We've had a gambling economy internationally for about 30 years and an incredible debt bubble build up of $1.4 quadrillion. So what do these guys say? We're going to do more of the same. We're not going to make a radical shift from the policies that destroyed us. We're going to try and maintain globalisation. We're going to, yeah, we're going to wrap a few hedge funds over the knuckles you know, we're going to try and tweak the controls a bit, but in terms of the fundamental cause, we're not looking at it. So it's an orgy of insanity. These bailouts are intentionally destroying what remains of national sovereignty around the world and sabotaging the possibility of sovereign nations collaborating toward a real economic recovery. The British Empire still today is out to prevent all moves toward creation of a new credit system in which sovereign nation states would be able to issue credit for the real physical economy. The bailout policies of Rudd won't work because he's not actually addressing the cause of the problem. 
What has to happen in this country is that we have to go for very large scale projects like the Australian Ring Rail proposal, nuclear power, high speed rail and infrastructure projects that have lifespans of 25, 50, 75 years and employ people into real jobs, not just throw money into the economy thinking that that's going to solve the problem. It won't. To protect the general welfare today, the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill must be implemented in the shortest time. Those individuals responsible for causing the economic crisis and those who have blocked this solution must be identified and brought to justice. Just as in the 1930s, where the United States Senate Counsel Ferdinand Pecora launched a ruthless investigation into the Wall Street bankers who swindled and looted the US people then, today, an Australian Pecora Commission is needed to name the names of who have gradually destroyed Australia's economy since the beginning of the 1980s. The role of the financial empire of London and its corrupt Australian stooges in banking and politics must be made clear. Over the 1980s into the 1990s and right up into the current period, We've seen a lot of private banks benefit from the public sell-off of assets um, through globalisation and privatisation. One of the main ones is, is Macquarie Bank, you know, with its Millionaires Club and active role in buying up public assets. So you have to say what deals have been done between those in government that promoted the policies of globalisation and privatisation in particular, economic rationalism, and these private banks. And there would be many, many people many, many past politicians that have benefited. Therefore, that's criminal in our book, in the CEC's book, in LaRouche's book. One of the things that's got to be looked at is how did people like Paul Keating themselves benefit from this? What was in it for them? The notable thing about Paul Keating is he's the chairman of the leading privatisation bank in Australia, Lazard Carnegie Wiley. This is a bank that makes its money from brokering the sale of public assets to private investors on behalf of governments. And they get paid massive fees for doing it. Millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions in some cases, like the case of Telstra. Um, most recently, Keating did not care what people, you know, that, that of his obvious conflict of interest when he became the main backer of New South Wales Premier Morrissey Emma's plan to sell off New South Wales electricity system. This was a scheme that nobody wanted. In the papers, every day is Paul Keating writing these articles saying, this has got to be done, this, this, is, this will realise my vision for a national electricity reform. But what he's not saying is, and my bank will make a lot of money brokering the sale. Bob Carr's the guy, who was Premier of New South Wales, signed all these deals, public-private partnership deals, with Macquarie Bank for toll roads. So New South Wales is covered with these private toll roads which are massively expensive to use. When Bob Carr quit politics suddenly in 2005, who did he go to work for? Macquarie Bank. And in doing so, he wasn't the first, I dare say he won't be the last, but he joins a host of former Keating government ministers, former Howard government ministers, Howard's brother, Paul Keating's sister, all public figures or associates public figures who have ended up with very cushy jobs on the various boards of Macquarie Bank satellites. We need to investigate Jeff Kennett's government in Victoria. Kennett oversaw, at that time, the most radical privatisation program in the world. Banks like Macquarie Bank made a lot of money out of these privatisations. Kennett's treasurer, Alan Stockdale, right, is making a lot of money working for them now, after arguably making them a lot of money when he was treasurer for, of Victoria, signing off on these privatisation deals. If you benefit from the sale of public assets and you're in government making the decisions of who gets what, that's criminal activity and we have to uncover that. We have to lift the lid on what's been going on for the last 30 years. And if people haven't got anything to hide in the sense that they've not been doing it, well, that's fine. But the criminals will get caught out. One of the biggest criminals, of course, was Alan Greenspan probably the biggest criminal in this whole operation. Because what did he do? He did something which had been classified as a crime in the state of California. 
And he used that when he came into office in the Federal Reserve System. He used a criminal activity and legalized it essentially as the activity of the Federal Reserve System. That is the use of financial derivatives. This is gambling. So what happened is we had legalized gambling by the legalized gamblers of New York City and elsewhere and of the world who were looting the people of the world, starving them, ruining their countries, a locust plague. This was a crime. It's a moral crime against humanity in its effect. Do you think that we owe anything to any of these characters? Are these kinds of bankers? Well, we don't owe a thing to them. They should get nothing. They robbed the country. Are we going to pay them for their claims to, to enjoy the benefits of robbery, of thievery, of looting? No, we have to protect. Our job is to defend the nation, to defend our republic and its people against all predators. And what are these? These were international predators coming in and looting our country, destroying it, ruining our people, destroying jobs, destroying health care, everything. You think these guys in a principle of equity have anything coming to them except punishment? They should, be lo they should consider themselves lucky to be allowed to walk away with nothing. The world is falling into a dark age. The financial collapse globally will continue, with Australia included, as long as the policies we have mistakenly adopted and accepted continue. As long as the direction of the economy is steered by private banking establishments and their failed system of free trade. Unless the measures discussed here, a government controlled bankruptcy reorganization and the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill are implemented, there is no chance of a real future. Nations around the world must return to their best traditions of scientific and technological progress as sovereign nations. LaRouche's Four Powers Agreement, the essential step toward constructing a new just economic system, is the only sane choice we have. Whether this better future is realised or not, depends upon whether you play a role organising and mobilising in your community. Now is the time to stop tolerating the corruption and incompetence of your political leadership and to dump the failed beliefs that have tied a noose around your neck.